Thank you, Nye, and uh, thank you, Marion, and uh, thank you to uh, the Center for Human Rights, Equity, and uh, Inclusion uh, for uh, partnering with the Law Commission today uh, to mark Inclusion Day uh, 2020. As Nye mentioned, my name is uh, Ryan Fritch. I am uh, legal counsel with the uh, Law Commission of Ontario, and uh, I am leading uh, several of uh, the Law Commission's digital rights-related projects, uh, including work that we are doing on law reform and uh, artificial intelligence. It is wonderful to see so many people here today. And I want to note that there are many dozens more who are watching this event uh, live uh, online. And what we're here to do today uh, is to explore a theme. And that theme is how artificial intelligence uh, is impacting human rights and inclusion at York University. As all of you know, I think uh, because you're self-selected and you're here today, uh, AI has been generating uh, tons of headlines over the last couple of years. Uh, some of these are promising, some of these are concerning, uh, and certainly I think all of these are worth talking about. So some of the headlines you've seen are things like this. In 15 years, artificial intelligence is going to displace about 40% of the jobs in the world. This was just reported by 60 Minutes uh, in January. You see stuff like this. Police to begin using live facial recognition cameras powered by artificial intelligence in London across the entirety of the city. This is reported in January of this year. Facebook's political ad system is using artificial intelligence to intentionally select polarizing content and to elevate that so it's more visible and generates more clicks. So artificial intelligence is shaping your understanding of the world, how you see the world, the political issues that are being brought to your attention. Uh, we've had it reported that uh, China has implemented a social credit scoring system that monitors behaviors through uh, apps uh, on people's phones and uses that to reward and punish citizens. We've also seen issues like uh, Twitter having to shut down up to 70 million fake and suspicious accounts uh, since uh, May of 2018. Those are accounts generated by artificial intelligence. They're creating identities, they're creating personas that are being used to propagate uh, political uh, and other kinds of messages. We've also found that uh, sophisticated artificial intelligence can be used to identify almost anyone in the country. And they do this by tracking your digital footprint uh, as you go through your day with your phone. Uh, this data can get uploaded to uh, data brokers, uh, and in some cases, they are polling your phone over 14,000 times a day. And the map you see here is an activity map uh, of a woman who was uh, tracked over time. Uh, her location was recorded over 86,000 times by her phone on average every 21 minutes, creating an incredibly detailed uh, map of her activities, uh, her relationships, uh, the kinds of things that she does, uh, and so forth. So needless to say, there's a lot of concerns uh, with artificial intelligence. Uh, but we're also uh, learning that artificial intelligence can help. Humans, of course, are biased too. And humans can be systematically discriminatory. And we've seen that with issues like uh, police carding uh, here in Toronto. Some suggest that artificial intelligence can diminish uh, human biases and remove them from uh, systems like carding. We're also seeing how artificial intelligence can be used to expand access to justice, expand access to government entitlements and services. And a great example of this is a new online civil dispute resolution system uh, out in BC, uh, which aims to uh, allow people to resolve legal disputes in a matter of days or weeks, rather than months or years, obviously saving lots of time and making the system a lot more uh, accessible, making rights more available and livable. We've seen some excellent examples of the use of AI in healthcare. Uh, already, artificial intelligence systems are outperforming the best radiologists in the United States, proactively identifying diseases long before symptoms appear and reducing errors and false positives. Again, efficiency, you know, savings of money, better outcomes for uh, patients. We also know quite infamously that AI is now the best chess player in the world. Artificial intelligence recently became the best Go player in the world, considered one of the uh, most sophisticated and strategic games we know. 
And of course, uh, poor Ken Jennings had to suffer the uh, embarrassment of losing to uh, uh, Deep Blue there, uh, the IBM artificial intelligence, uh, who is now the best uh, Jeopardy player in the world by quite a margin. He's got about 50,000 grand over, uh, over uh, poor Ken there. So with AI, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, we seem to be hearing that the sky is the limit, uh, but also that the sky is falling. Uh, and I think this image is kind of emblematic of that. You know, if you're an optimist, you look at this as uh, two bros fist bumping, I think. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a little less, uh, if you're a little more worried about it, uh, what you got here is uh, the AI and the human uh, fighting and arguing. So these are some of the examples of uh, how AI is manifesting the kinds of issues that we can foresee coming. And what these all have in common uh, is that they uh, preview for us uh, the kinds of issues that uh, we are going to start seeing here at this institution, uh, at York University, uh, both uh, as an institution uh, that provides services and also as a community uh, where we come together uh, and engage uh, in, in learning. These, of course, also all raise uh, human rights concerns. Questions like, am I being treated fairly by a human resources algorithm when I apply for a job or a practicum placement? How would I know that the AI is even being used as a filter to determine which applicants uh, might be successful? If I walk onto campus, uh, will an artificial intelligence recognize my face, track my profile over time? Could I be monitored in the classroom for performance or attendance? How does artificial intelligence see me if I am gendered, racialized, from a cultural community, disabled, or wearing a veil? Can it take that into account? What if the AI is biased? What if the AI discriminates? What can I do about it? How do I challenge it? And of course, then, what does all this mean for inclusion and our sense of belonging uh, to this community? These are all forward-looking concerns, and I want to be clear uh, that what we're doing here today is peering into the future. Uh, it's early days for artificial intelligence. But I also think that that's the right time to ask how this institution, how York University, is preparing to answer these kinds of questions and how human rights and inclusion can guide their responses. So we've got some big questions, but we've also got some uh, big brains from York University uh, to help us explore uh, some of these issues. And I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists who are uh, here with us today. Uh, over on the far left is uh, Incia Esagi. Uh, Incia is legal counsel with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, where she helps lead their initiatives on bias and discrimination in artificial intelligence. Uh, particularly in relation to social media and predictive policing. Uh, to INSEA's right is Trevor Farrow. Uh, Trevor is a professor of law at Osgoode Hall, uh, where he leads uh, research on access to justice. Trevor is also working with Cyber Justice Lab at the University of Montreal uh, to explore how technology can help or hinder uh, access to justice initiatives. To Trevor's right is Ruth Erner. Uh, Ruth is a professor in the Department of Engineering and Computer Science, where she conducts cutting-edge work on the mathematics behind AI and machine learning. And to my immediate left is Regina Rini. Regina is a professor of philosophy specializing in moral cognition, and her research focuses on how AI and social media are shaping democratic participation and citizenship. Uh, Regina is also cross-appointed to the York Vista Lab, uh, which is using artificial intelligence to explore uh, visual recognition uh, technology. Say hello, everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. Um, our format for today is uh, a little bit unique. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, break uh, today up into uh, three segments. Uh, each segment will be about uh, 20 minutes long. Uh, and then we'll discuss each of these segments uh, among the panelists. And the segments are this. Uh, first, what is AI? Uh, how does it work? and what kinds of concerns uh, is it raising? This will be our introduction to set some basic terms, uh, come to an understanding of how the technology intersects with uh, policy and human rights concerns, uh, and start sort of charting the course for our discussion. Second then, uh, we'll take a look at how AI is specifically impacting uh, York University and uh, what it means for human rights and inclusion uh, at a university institution. Uh, and then three, we'll poll the panelists here uh, for what are some of the fixes and what York University can start doing now 
uh, to prepare for this uh, artificial intelligence powered uh, future. So what I'll do is uh, I will uh, start each segment by sort of uh, setting it up with a little bit of an introduction, uh, and then we'll pivot to our uh, panelists uh, to get their uh, responses to those kinds of issues. Uh, we also want to uh, include the audience in this discussion. Uh, so if you're in the room with me today, uh, we've got a microphone set up there. And uh, what I'll do is sort of towards the end of our Q&A with the panelists, I'll invite uh, a couple of people from the audience to come up. If you're watching uh, live online, uh, you can see a link here on this slide, uh, www.yorku.ca slash rights. And if you click that link, you'll be able to submit uh, a question to us today. That sound good? Yeah? All right, great. So let's get started. So our first segment is uh, what is AI? And uh, for most of us, uh, AI probably kind of looks like this in your mind. Uh, it's a computer in the cloud uh, doing sophisticated tasks that have normally been the job of humans. Uh, this is things like uh, picking out Christmas photos from your, your 10 years of uh, pictures. You know, you upload it to the cloud, you say, give me all my Christmas photos, and somehow it does it. Well, how does AI do that? It does it by learning to recognize patterns uh, and meaning. And it does this through algorithms. Uh, we've always, of course, had algorithms, and we've always used these to predict the future. Some algorithms can be very simple. Some can be complex. But uh, basically, they're cause and effect, uh, like Newton here. Algorithms can also operate heuristically, uh, like a decision-making tree. Uh, they can be based on various inputs or options uh, defined as part of the heuristic. And then when you digitize that, an apparently complex decision can be made nearly instantaneously, uh, albeit still in predefined ways, right? Algorithms, of course, can also operate statistically. Uh, they can make determinations about people through behavioral models based on observation and validated predictors, and with results interpreted uh, by other people. Uh, this example is the OCAN, the Ontario Common Assessment of Need, uh, which is used to identify people uh, at risk in the community, and particularly those uh, who touch uh, mental health services. And it's used to profile their needs and connect them to, uh, to the best service. So we've been using algorithms widely and for a long time, and we've been using them on people. What AI does is it takes all this uh, to the next level. Whereas algorithms are set by humans and validated by humans and applied by humans and provided input data by humans, AI uses a more open-ended approach to detect new patterns and relationships all by itself. And this might be with human assistance uh, or not. It can be self-directing. This process is generally referred to as uh, machine learning. Uh, and in more advanced uh, examples, neural networks and deep learning. AI and machine learning are not just one thing. It's software. So it can be developed and applied anywhere that there's a huge set of data from which to learn and detect patterns in that data. This can obviously be really good. Unlike a human, AI can actually look at millions and millions and millions of radiology scans, right? And learn from those what it is to identify uh, a cancer tumor and to distinguish that from uh, false positives uh, and negatives. Uh, AI can also churn through the uh, terabytes of data uh, that are used to model weather systems and come up with better uh, weather predictions than a human could ever do. Material science, uh, drug development, protein folding, all of these things are things that uh, AI can do better than people uh, because they're able to scan vast amounts uh, of data, certainly much more than a human uh, could ever do themselves. Where things get a little bit more fuzzy, though, uh, is when you unleash this uh, self-directed machine learning on patterns uh, of human behavior and human activity. Uh, inferences are made from data, data which is historical and often gathered for specific purposes and in specific contexts. Data which can be merged between health sector, uh, social support, education, policing, tax records, and so forth. And this data can be put to new uh, uses, can be used to make new predictions and come to new conclusions that are assumed to be valid and acted upon uh, in the real world. So you kind of get the picture. You get where we can get into some problems. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, uh, but in our data. That's going to be used to make decisions, predictions, and come to conclusions uh, about uh, often very fuzzy uh, human behavior. 
So there are clearly uh, biases in the data uh, and inference that are being made uh, that can uh, color outcomes. This can reflect historical and ongoing discrimination and oppression. And these can trigger concerns for human rights because the data might be normative. It might not take into account disability. It might not take into account race, creed, faith, culture, color, gender, sexual orientation, uh, indigenous status, or any of the other protected equity-seeking groups. As some have said, not all data is biased, but no data is neutral. And it's that data that AI is interpreting uh, to uh, come to conclusions. A couple of examples of this in practice have emerged as uh, problematic elsewhere, uh, but also already uh, here in Canada. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, for example, recently decided a case called Ewart. Uh, Mr. Ewart was denied parole on the basis of his risk score. They used an algorithm uh, to decide whether he'd be at risk for uh, reoffending. What the Supreme Court found, though, was that the tool was never developed to take into account Mr. Ewart's indigenous identity. Mr. Ewart was Métis. And despite the fact that 30% of incarcerated people in Canada uh, are indigenous, this tool that's being used to predict risk and recidivism didn't take indigenous identity into account. So on that basis, the Supreme Court uh, overturned the finding uh, and uh, said you have to reassess Mr. Ewart uh, with an appropriate tool. That wasn't an AI-driven example, uh, but we are seeing AI used uh, in other circumstances in other jurisdictions. So we can look to the United States, where about 30% of criminal court jurisdictions are now using AI systems to determine eligibility for bail. So a decision is being made about you, about whether you have your liberty or not, based on a bunch of factors that are fed uh, into an AI system. And this is a system that's uh, being used very broadly down in the States from an uh, organization called Arnold Ventures. Uh, and you plug in some personal characteristics and they come up with a score. And then uh, they use that to determine whether or not you should be eligible uh, for bail. Uh, we're also uh, seeing AI used in predictive policing, uh, where predictions are being made about uh, where a crime might occur and who might uh, commit it. And this is a, a predictive heat map being used right now by the Vancouver Police Department. And what they're doing is trying to predict where uh, property crimes might occur. And then once they've identified hotspots, they actually proactively send police out to monitor an area of a couple hundred square meters uh, for criminal activity. It's kind of pre-policing, right? I think we saw that in the uh, Minority Report movie. This kind of system is live right now uh, in Vancouver. Uh, we're also seeing AI being used in government assessments, uh, where AI is being used to determine eligibility for social housing or welfare entitlements, or how fraud is monitored, or profiling at-risk families. Uh, for proactive investigations. In the UK, uh, they've now profiled 377,000 uh, families uh, to try and predict where uh, children might be precarious. And they're proactively sending people out to investigate those families, right? That's raising a lot of concerns. And we're also seeing AI being used uh, with visual data. Uh, AI is now driving facial recognition and license plate recognition systems uh, that can be used for uh, mass surveillance on a citywide level. Uh, these systems, of course, are notoriously error-prone, with false positives often outweighing accurate identifications. This is also a great example, though, of how AI and data can be gamed, and how diversity can be gamed. Um, a recent report found that dating websites online are generating fake people to meet identity targets, to make it look like there's a diversity of people on this uh, dating website, uh, when in fact there isn't. So they're using AI to create the illusion of diversity while actually actively uh, suppressing it. And you can try this out yourself. Uh, if you go to this website, www.thispersondoesnotexist.com, you'll be connected to an AI system that can generate a fake human with every single click. So in less than a minute, I generated these four faces, and none of these people have ever existed. They look pretty convincing, I got to say. And they would appear to represent uh, a diversity, but what they actually represents the diversity of the AI, anticipating what I'm looking for, right, and feeding me that. So you can uh, game these systems and, and make it look like you are meeting diversity objectives uh, when in fact you're doing uh, exactly the opposite. So where does this take us? I think it indicates, uh, as Nye sort of indicated, uh, a couple of key policy issues with AI 
uh, that should guide us in analyzing its use. First, uh, you often don't even know and won't know uh, when an AI is being used. So transparency and, dis and disclosure uh, is a key issue. A great example of that is how human resources departments are now using AI to filter through job applications, right? Why do I never get a call back, right? Well, it might be that an AI system doesn't like what it sees. You wouldn't even know. So how could you enforce your rights under the human rights code not to be discriminated against? You need transparency and disclosure in these systems. Second, uh, data and its relationship to bias and discrimination. As I said, not all data is biased, but no data is neutral. Selectivity is a big problem. How is the data being generated? Where was it collected by? Who's auditing and overseeing the data? Who's participating in the collection of the data and, and talking about how it's being used? Are these systems being developed collaboratively? These are the kinds of issues that that raises. Third major problem with uh, machine learning and AI is explainability. It is very hard to get a machine learning algorithm to explain how it came to a determination. You can ask a person what information they relied on. You can quiz their logic. Uh, you can ask them to explain and rationalize their decision. It's really difficult to do that uh, with a machine uh, learning system. And then if you want to do that uh, in a sort of formal way, if you want to challenge the decision of an AI, you know, what evidence do you call? What witness do you call? Uh, how do you cross-examine an artificial intelligence? These are very practical uh, problems when you're thinking about uh, legal or administrative systems. And fourth, uh, what are the wider impacts of these problems on inclusion and exclusion? Uh, we've already heard that exclusion is a problem. An AI can decide who gets to see a job ad or a housing ad online. We've also heard that over-inclusion can be a problem, such as when an AI uses historically biased data to falsely decide that race is a predictor of crime and to proactively monitor uh, those kinds of populations. Either way, uh, it erodes participation uh, in the community. So considerable promise, troublesome aspects uh, with AI. And the question is for today, how do we uh, address these challenges and opportunities uh, in the university context? I think if we were lazy, we would just ask Google. But obviously, Google's going to be biased, right? So who we have here today is uh, some panelists. And we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. We're going to talk to humans about these kinds of issues. Uh, so let me uh, now pivot to uh, our panelists and ask questions. And uh, I'll just remind everyone that uh, if you want to ask a question uh, towards the end of this panel, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to come up. And uh, if you want to submit a question online, uh, just go to this link, www.yorku.ca slash rights. Uh, so Ruth, uh, you are our resident uh, machine learning and algorithmic expert. Uh, I might start with you. Uh, I think uh, one of the first questions that uh, comes into someone's mind is, uh, if these are technological problems, why is it so hard for there to be technological solutions to these things? That's a very good question. Um, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me here. It's sure. a great event. Um, so, so I think these, these questions are inherently um, not technical questions, right? Mm. So why, why isn't there a technical solution to, to problems like bias and fairness? Um, First of all, um, there's no, no technical solution because we are, as humans, we are struggling with defining what, what fairness should be, what is bias. Mm. Um, so these are all questions um, that, that first need to be um, um, answered and probably answered in various ways um, from, 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 by all of us, right? So it's not inherently a technical, a technical problem. So therefore, there's also not going to be a technical solution, right? So of course, there was some hope that if we can automate um, um, decision making, then maybe there were, maybe we'll be more, more objective. Maybe, maybe a system will be more objective, will be less biased. But of course, what, what we've been seeing is that a system inherits um, the bias of the, the data. If it's a machine learning system, it's going to inherit the, um, the bias of the data that, it, that it's been trained on, mm. right? Um, so, so I think the situation that we're in is that technology kind of um, puts light onto these issues, um, but of course they need to be answered um, um, from, from various sides. Yeah. Um, and, and not necessarily by, by technologists. So, so what we can do as technologists is that um, what we should, or what, we, what I'm hoping what we should be doing is 
um, engaging into, into conversations and developing a language between technical people um, and, and, and people from other disciplines so that we can better understand each other so that maybe the technology side um, will be better, um, will start de to develop solutions um, to these issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I'll stop here for what, now. Yeah. What is it that makes these systems such a black box? This is what some people call it sometimes. You know, I'm thinking of an example like uh, uh, famously Amazon was using an artificial intelligence to filter job applications. And they had to scrap the whole system because it turns out it was totally biased against women, right? They relied on a historical set of data that said most engineers are men, therefore we're gonna hire men, right? How come I can't just go in the algorithm and say, no, but also hire women? Like, wh why, is that, uh, why is that a difficulty? Right, so maybe, maybe first of all, why are some systems being called black box? Um, so, I mean, what you've mentioned in your, um, your presentation before is that currently um, the most, at prediction, the most successful tools are, are neural networks. So we use neural networks. They're for many problems very, very successful at getting predictions correct, right? So you, so you mentioned medical examples. So maybe a, a machine learning trained tool is very good at taking an image and detecting whether there's some tumor in the image and, and we don't really, um, so there are these situations where we maybe we don't um, care so much for there being an explanation. How did this pixel in the image contribute to um, the, the algorithm deciding that there, there is a tumor or not? Mm -hmm. right? But there are other situations where we do care about that, right? So there are, there are other situations where just throwing some neural networks where each of the, the parts of the neural network doesn't have a you know, human understandable meaning. Right. Um, is, is, not, is not a suitable model to use, right? So, so maybe in other situation, um, it is more suitable to use, a, to, to use a model that is inherently human and uh, interpretable, human understandable. But this may very often come at a, with a trade-off for, for getting the prediction correct, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're maybe using a type of system that is, um, that is more restricted, therefore, allows giving human explanation, but maybe maybe it comes at a price of making more prediction errors. Okay. So many situations we have to, um, there's a trade-off between be, between these different issues and we, we all, well, I think what we'll need to do is we'll need to make them transparent and need to develop ways of um, show, showing what these trade-offs are to, to somebody who's not, maybe a non-technical user. Okay, right. it's an excellent point. Uh, I like the point about uh, interdisciplinarity, that uh, these aren't just neutral systems, they need to be informed by human questions. Uh, let's, we're gonna hold on to that one, I think, for our third uh, segment today when we turn our mind to solutions. Let's, let's keep that one in mind. Um, Incia, uh, we're looking at how AI is intersecting uh, with human rights concerns for uh, bias and discrimination. These, of course, are uh, protected uh, issues under Ontario's uh, Human Rights Code. From your perspective, are these problems uh, a little too far in the future? Are we overstating some of these problems? Or are you at the Human Rights Commission already starting to see some of these kinds of issues and, uh, and contending with the practical implications? I Generally, when I think about AI and human rights, I, I think there's sort of two baskets of things that come up, and they link to what Ryan was talking about earlier. So one big basket is all of these things relating to AI that are really raising human rights concerns. And I, I don't, you, you know, I think from where we sit right now, I, I don't think that they're overstated in the sense that a lot of the early uses of AI are revealing these types of problems. But then the second basket is sort of AI for good. Like there mm. are all of these ways that we can also see AI, how AI tools could be used to help organizations meet their human rights obligations. And maybe just by way of like a little bit of background. So I'm a uh, counsel at the Ontario Human Rights Commission and our mandate or our job is to try and enforce a law in Ontario called the Human Rights Code. And as Ryan mentioned briefly, the Human Rights Code protects everyone from discrimination based on these parts of our identity. So things like age, gender identity, religion, disability, race. Um, and it offers that protection in these different sort of spheres of how we interact with each other. They're called social areas. So it applies to, you know, it protects us from discrimination relating to employment, to housing, to um, how services are provided. And so when we're thinking about York, York is engaged in all of those things. You know, York employs hundreds of faculty and staff. York is providing services to students. And so, you know, it's 
definitely, definitely something applicable here. Um, and then sort of linking back to those two baskets of, you know, AI that is alarming from that perspective of trying to protect against discrimination. Uh, you know, as, as both Ryan and Ruth have sort of commented on, there have been a lot of issues with AI and, and bias. So if we're sort of linking back to York, if York, um, like Amazon, starts using an AI tool to assess job applications or tenure decisions or who gets funding, then there could be sort of issues with kind of the outcomes from that system or even student admissions. Uh, and similarly, though, there's this sort of other category of how we could maybe use AI tools to try and meet human rights obligations. And one area where that's coming up a lot in, is in terms of providing accessible education. So um, an example that's maybe kind of relevant for the way that we're set up here is, uh, so right now, something that's really great is that there's live captioning going on on the screen over there, which can be so helpful from an accessibility perspective. So something that as, as AI language processing tools have become more sophisticated, something that can happen, I think now with PowerPoint presentations is you can have, um, you can sort of click a button and then have live captioning show up at the bottom of a PowerPoint. And that could be, you know, so a professor in a classroom could, you know, um, have captions of what they're saying show up as they're delivering a PowerPoint presentation. And then that can even also be translated in real time. So students in the room could have their computer or their phone and see that same presentation with the captions showing up in a language that they select. And so that could be a way that AI is really helpful in terms of meeting human rights obligations to provide accessible education to people with disabilities, to international students. So I feel like I, I see the, I, I am worried and I do stay up at night <laughs> based on things that we're, we're seeing so far. And then at the same time, you see a lot of potential for the ways that we could use these tools to like promote human rights. I think your example of uh, an AI tool, for example, providing live translation is great. Uh, sometimes you don't even know when these things are in operation. Uh, I remember several months ago, uh, Facebook had a technical error. And all of a sudden, when you went onto Facebook, you didn't see the photos that were on your page, but you saw sort of text descriptions mm -hmm. of what the content of those photos were. And everyone was kind of freaking out because they're like, hey man, Facebook has like, you know, uh, semantic interpreters operating here uh, invisibly in the background. They know that that picture shows all my friends, but they also know that it was Christmas and they know that we were skiing and you know, all this kind of stuff. And it kind of freaked people out because it gave them a sense of how it, it sort of unveiled what their digital footprint actually was. Mm -hmm. Um, so Trevor, uh, for me, that kind of raises uh, some of these concerns around uh, transparency uh, and disclosure. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how, uh, maybe from a legal or procedural perspective, uh, we need to be thinking about AI and how to make it fairer for people. What are some of the kinds of uh, rights-related issues that, uh, that it raises for you? Well, thanks, Ryan. Um, a couple of things, and maybe I'll start by putting my cards on the table. I think there's, there has been and there probably will be talk about balance, and we need to balance, uh, and I think that's right. I think where I'm at at the moment is I'm on the, the pro ledger as opposed to the con side of the ledger, but we'll see where I'm at after this <laughs> whole session. Um, so I think actually Ruth started us off with this question about it's, it's not just about technology, it's about thinking about notions of fairness. Um, notions about justice, notions about, you know, what do we want from this? And I guess where I come at this question, you know, we can come at it from a, from a legal perspective, what does procedural fairness require and sort of disclosure and people knowing what their rights, and these come back to basic rule of law values that we are meant to be judged by things that we understand, that we see, that we can predict, that we can be part of. Uh, and so some of the fears, Ryan, that you raised about not knowing what's deciding whether I get bail or whether I get um, uh, a certain outcome in a process, the problem with that, of course, is the transparency piece. We're supposed to know uh, those who are facing us in the, in the justice system. Having said that, though, um, I think one of the things is to be honest about where the justice system is at or how people use the system. So I think maybe one relevant way to come at this is we recently did a survey of um, about 3,500 Canadians to see how Canadians use the justice system and what they do when they have a problem. So a couple things are interesting there, I think. Over a three-year period, Canadians, adult Canadians, so people over 18, year old, 18 year, years old, 
have about 35 million legal problems. And those are sort of meaningful problems of a legal nature. Um, how they deal with those is less than 7% of people experiencing a problem go to a court or tribunal. So meaning 93% of stuff never gets to the formal system. Mm. Um, and then if you ask, so what about, do they use lawyers? Well, less than 20% of people use lawyers uh, to address their problems. So then that means over 80% of people are doing something else. So then what else are they doing? And of the other things that they're doing, including talking to their neighbors, talking to their friends, um, in 2014, about 35% of people were accessing what they call the internet uh, to try and address their legal problems. So, um, and that was in 2014, so that's five years ago or six years ago, or obviously I didn't, I'm not a mathematician. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it certainly hasn't gone down from there in terms of people accessing um, technology to figure out what to do about your legal problems. And now we've got people doing research on the effectiveness of accessing non-humans about how to manage their problems. Mm. And the results are still out. I don't have good data on that, but um, a grad student colleague here, Matthew Dialig, is doing research on people accessing Reddit and whether you know, sort of artificial help or real help from people is valuable or not. Mm. Um, and early findings from him and others are that it's not that helpful. So um, there's, and we also know from data that people usually do better with help than without help. So it's all over the map. Mm. Um, and I think the, the, the bottom line that I'm starting to think about is, let's be honest about where we're at. We can't afford to get everyone a lawyer and a perfect lawyer. Um, and so we need something else. We've got way too many problems that we can deal with with the lawyers we have or the humans we have. So I think we do need help and artificial help. Um, there's lots of examples that Ryan's talked about in terms of algorithms that will predict outcomes yeah. of cases. Um, and so now I think the, the interesting piece is how do we find that balance about not should we use it, but how do we use it, what is valuable, and sorting through that bias. And just remembering that the human side of this is not unbiased either. We've got years and years of biased judgments, biased lawyers, biased outcomes. And so I'm not sure the data is any worse. Um, whether it's better or not is your point about uh, it's all what we put into it. Right. Uh, I think for me that kind of raises questions about who participates in the design of these systems as well. Uh, as you were speaking, I was just thinking about AI as an access to justice tool. And I thought for a lot of people that'll probably look like Siri or Alexa. And I'm imagining a world where someone says, hey Siri, what are my tenant rights? <laughs> you know, and how do I act on it? Well. Uh, Siri will have a view on that unless it's informed quite broadly by a whole array of lawyers and tenants and landlords. You know, so to, to produce these kinds of systems for them to be, I think, meaningful, uh, it sort of begs that question about who's participating in their creation. Uh, and that, I think, might have some lessons for us as we turn our mind to uh, what this university uh, can do. Uh, Regina, I've got a question for you, too. Um, you know, one thing we saw in the uh, introduction is that uh, more and more services are being offered online now uh, because AI is getting more sophisticated, can respond to uh, a wider array of uh, questions that people can uh, ask. Um, I think people too are also turning online, as sort of Trevor said, for advice uh, and information. And when you think about this in the university of context, of course, your mind instantly turns to ratemyprof.com uh, and how students are making choices about what classes they take uh, based on those kinds of opinions online, uh, but also in relation to AI, you know, which profs kind of get promoted to the top of the list, how they're scored, you know, those kinds of issues are obviously starting to uh, influence people's decisions uh, in the real world. So, uh, if AI is sort of shaping the way we see the world, you know, what does this mean, I think, for inclusion uh, and diversity uh, of opinions, and what does it mean for uh, this university as a community, uh, where we're trying to promote inclusion and promote a wider array of voices rather than minimizing them. So, uh, first, thanks so much for having me on the panel. This is a really, really valuable discussion to be having. So the, I, I'm a philosophy professor. I teach moral philosophy, including classes on the ethics of technology. And so the way I'm thinking about this is often in terms of the interaction of the technology and people. How, do, how are we changed by this new technology and the way it affects the way we relate to others? And so a lot of my concern about AI right now is that we're getting a reflection back from the technology, a reflection of society that is distorted in some ways, that produces a feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. And we end up actually re-amplifying some of the biases that are already in society. 
So one, one clear example of this, I think, uh, there's a communications professor named Sophia Noble, who teaches in California, who's done some excellent work uh, about 10 years ago on how basically Google searches will misrepresent populations. So it was true that if you searched for uh, black girls or Asian women, you would primarily get sites that were about pornography or about criminality or about things like that. Mm -hmm. And this was not because Google was doing this on purpose, it was because it was a very bad induction based upon how other people were searching, what other people were typing in to complete the search terms. But because uh, Google autocomplete starts showing you the most likely outcome that other people are typing, mm -hmm. you start getting the perception that it makes you associate those terms together. And it actually changes over time the way you relate to the world. Mm -hmm. So the technology is not just being affected by us, it's turning back and affecting us. Another example of this that I've been thinking a lot about is the way that interacting with AI can kind of make us more impatient with human imperfection. What I mean by that is if you go right now on like say a travel site and you want to book a flight and you're like, you know, it's a computer's doing it all for you, but you start having trouble, this little box pops up in the corner that says, how can I help you with this? And it pretends to be a person, but it's actually in most cases initially a chat bot. It's an AI thing. However, if that doesn't work, then behind the scenes somewhere, an actual human being at some call center or, or um, you know, HR, uh, customer service thing takes over and starts typing. But the device doesn't actually tell you that's happened. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you go from interacting with a little chatbot that actually is just a computer. If it can't handle your problem, then suddenly it's replaced by a real person. Mm -hmm. But you are not told that happened. And what this is training us to do is to interact with these things that are kind of like hybrids between humans and computers mm -hmm. and expect them to just do what we ask. It can be just as rude as you want to that machine and it feels fine because if you're not <laughs> talking to a person, it seems like, but really you are. And so that's the kind of thing I'm worried about, that we're getting trained by this technology to expect everybody to just be at our beck and call. Right. And, and once that gets connected to the way that the technology reflects back to us our own stereotypes and prejudices, put those two things together, and my real worry is that people get, get um, crude about these things. They get, get callous. They, they don't really care anymore. Uh, we're not there yet, I hope, but that's the kind of the back and forth I'm worried about right now. Wow. Uh, your comment about uh, people being rude to machines uh, reminded me of uh, Microsoft's uh, sort of failed experiment in uh, putting a chat bot live on Twitter. Uh, Microsoft, a couple of years ago, released uh, a machine learning chat bot that they just allowed open access to Twitter and people could interact and converse with this thing. And less than 24 hours after letting this thing live on Twitter unsupervised, they had to shut the entire experiment down uh, because everyone had trained this, uh, this uh, AI uh, to basically be a, uh, a fascist uh, misanthrope. And all of its comments were like, you know, pro-fascist this and anti-women that. Um, so it, you know, it, it also shows how easily these things can be gamed, I think. Uh, which is uh, which is a big concern. Um, final question for uh, the panel uh, at large. Uh, we're raising a lot of opportunities. We're raising a lot of concerns. Uh, what kinds of regulatory systems might be in place for any of this? I mean, uh, it's early days, but has there been any kind of regulatory response? How are we thinking about uh, how this relates to uh, to law or, or policy? Where are we at on any of that? Human Rights Commission. I mean, does, does this fall under your your mandate for? Uh, uh, governing, you know, services and uh, and those kinds of things. I think that's a great question. Something I find in discussions around sort of AI use and um, you know as, as technology progresses, like I guess like just other things online, is this sense that like everything's advancing so quickly and you know it's so different than the things that we have before and you know so we need new laws to deal with this stuff and the laws not keeping up and you know like just a lot of concern about that and I think that it is really important to be asking those questions but sometimes we have legal frameworks in place or we already have laws and they just continue to apply so you know the human rights code which we've been talking about protects us from discrimination and that doesn't change if it's you know uh, so so if we're talking about discrimination in employment and you know making hiring decisions if it's a person making that decision and they're being discriminatory in how they do that by say you know not um, you know discriminating against women and hiring that's covered by the human rights code but if it's AI doing it it doesn't suddenly mean it's not covered by the human rights code and so I think that um, you know. I, there, there is a great deal of importance to thinking about the right ways of regulating these things, but I think that it's also really important that places are being vigilant about if, if you're going to start using uh, AI or a new tool, what 
are, are you using that in a way that complies with the laws that already exist to protect our human rights? Those do continue to apply. And the fact that it's now applying, or that you're now using something new like AI doesn't change that it's still against the law to discriminate against people. Um, just picking up on NCO's, NCO's point about the laws don't go out the window just simply because we're moving from a different uh, platform, right? The human platform to a different platform, which I totally agree with. Um, and Ryan, in your opening, you talked about uh, US courts using uh, AI for decision, decision making. Well, uh, a similar, although a, a different example, um, as I understand it, the, the Chief Justice, I believe, of the Singapore court recently in the opening of the courts talked about the court now using AI to predict outcomes. Um, but the, the judge was, per, was very careful to say, we're not using them to determine them. We are using them running in the background to give us a sense of what the machine thinks we should do. Mm -hmm. And then we will use that material, uh, amongst other things, to come up with our actual human decision. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, um, that could go several ways. But I think, uh, picking up on Encia's point, I think the idea that we need to understand what the case is that's being made against us in the context of a legal context, the lawyers or the litigants at least need to know what's going on at least need to understand the platform and the information that's going in and coming out and how it's being used by the judge. Mm -hmm. That would at least take us some way down the road to having a notion of procedural fairness, recognizing that adding that um, uh, machine learning around outcomes might actually do a better job than having judges sort of think through maybe on a given day what it should, what it should be. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that both of these uh, examples uh, leave a lot up to discretion. Uh, Human Rights Code might cover this in a certain circumstance, might not. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court in uh, Singapore, you know, they are taking uh, the advice of the machine uh, and then interpreting themselves. Others might just go with the advice. Um, to me, it kind of says how uh, all of these systems are kind of relying on uh, private regulation, right? They're deciding uh, how they ought to interpret and uh, regulate and govern the AI, which I think has implications for this university too. Uh, if there aren't clear uh, obligations on some of this stuff, a lot of it's going to end up being on the administration here to decide uh, how they're going to interpret it. And uh, in my mind, that kind of invites again this question of uh, uh, having everyone involved in the discussion around uh, how they want these uh, technologies to be governed uh, in their community. Um, I've got one question online. Are there any questions for this segment uh, panel here in the room? No? Uh, one question that uh, came in online uh, is asking uh, how um, these algorithmic systems are making determinations based on uh, mathematical properties. Uh, so would it make uh, sense for uh, us to take a closer look at who constructs these parameters and hold them accountable uh, as opposed to the AI itself? So I guess it kind of goes to the uh, question of uh, tracing responsibility back to uh, the programmer. Uh, is, is that an effective strategy, Ruth? Does that sort of uh, dovetail with what you were saying about we need to involve more people in the creation of these things? Um, yeah, I mean, that's this question. I mean, so how, how was it phrased? Who, who, who defines these parameters? Um, yeah. Um, so the way machine learning works is that, I mean, we, we generally, we, we set up a, I mean, yeah, so I mean, this will maybe show where the, where the, where the mismatch in, in language and, and, and understanding is. So I would say um, the way machine learning work is that we set up a framework for parameters to be set. And then um, these parameters, I mean, machine learning algorithms, what they do is they, they, they optimize these parameters ba based, based, on, um, based on data, right? So who is, who, is now, who is now responsible for the parameters? I mean, it's of course, it's, it's, it's a mixture of the, the algorithm being used, it's a mixture of the optimization. A method being used of, of the model of the person that decides to use an automated system um, um, for a particular prediction problems. So I don't think it's um, um, we can pinpoint um, a person being responsible for a particular parameter. Right. Right? So what we can do is we can try to analyze the overall system and see um, which of these factors come into play um, mm. in in what ways. Right. Responsibility um, so. by design, you know, might be a way yeah. to think about it. Yeah. 
um, I think that's really helpful because the, we can't think about this as just uh, a strict input output thing where like yeah. programmers tell the thing it's going to believe such and such or do such and such. Mm -hmm. I think of a really helpful model as being something like how we raise children, <laughs> where how we hold parents responsible. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we think that parents get to you know press a button and make their kids do such and such, but we do think that um, you know parents are responsible for what their kids do while they're raising their kids. They're responsible both in the sense that they had input and in how the child grows up, but also they have responsibility for supervising the child and making sure the child doesn't wander off and cause problems. And I think that's a good model for thinking about these machines. It's not that programmers can control exactly what they do, but programmers do have input on how they're constructed and I think should be responsible for monitoring them and not letting them wander off and cause chaos. So mm -hmm. I think that's the most helpful model I've been able to think of. Yeah, I'm looking at parents in the room and I'm not seeing a lot of confidence uh, <laughs> with, with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Okay, great, great discussion on uh, segment one there. Let's move on now to uh, segment two. Uh, now that we have a bit of a handle on all this, let's take a look specifically uh, at how AI might uh, intersect uh, with the university and what this might mean for inclusion and diversity uh, at uh, York University. A couple of examples that uh, I came across in doing the research for this panel. Uh, one is how uh, facial recognition, AI-driven facial recognition, uh, might land on campus. Uh, this image comes from a recent report from 60 Minutes, uh, who took a look at a tool developed by the TAL, the TAL Education Group, uh, which, uh, which tutors uh, 5 million Chinese students. Uh, what TAL has done is deploy a facial recognition AI that operates live in the classroom. And what it does is it monitors the faces of all of the students, identifies who the students are, and it measures things like how engaged they are. You know, are they watching the front of the room? It measures their sort of like emotional response to things. Do they look uh, bored? Do they look excited? Uh, and then it uses these things to uh, make inferences about the performance of the student. Uh, if a student is flagged as not paying enough attention, you know, they'll send an alert to the teacher. Uh, if uh, a student, uh, looks like they've got a furrowed brow and they're struggling, you know. Um, you know, the student might get referred for additional tutoring uh, after the fact. Um, what this is also helping to fuel is virtual teaching. Uh, so uh, the argument is that because you're getting uh, more uh, emotive, more human feedback through the AI, the teacher doesn't need to be in the classroom. You can now teach virtually because you're sort of getting that, that pseudo hands-on, that pseudo face-to-face -face experience uh, and so it promotes uh, more uh, virtual presence, more virtual teaching uh, in the classroom. Obviously, if I was a student, I'd be pretty concerned uh, that this might somehow play a role in my performance measurement, right, and the grade I might get. Uh, and again, how would I know? How do I know what criteria it's relying on? What input do I have into those? Those kinds of questions are, uh, are arising with this. Uh, facial recognition is also playing a role in uh, surveillance on uh, US campuses. Uh, down in the States, a group called Fight for the Future uh, did a survey of uh, several hundred uh, university campuses in the United States and found that many uh, are already using facial recognition on campus. So you walk onto campus, it reads your face, it identifies who you are, uh, and it starts making uh, records uh, about your behavior. How often do you come onto campus? Are you on time? They can correlate it with your, uh, your class schedule. Um, they can probably try and measure things like diversity and say, look what a wonderfully diverse campus we have. Um, obviously, they could use it for security too. Uh, so uh, if you're not supposed to be on campus at a certain time of day or at all, you know, this might trigger a security response. Uh, those kinds of issues are arising. And if you check out this uh, website, uh, you'll, uh, they have all of their data there uh, from their survey results. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary how many uh, campuses in the U.S. are already using facial recognition and how many have said, frankly, that they, they might well do so, that they might well implement it in the next uh, couple of years. Um, to that point, actually, uh, uh, Wired also reported on uh, a group called uh, Real Networks who produced this technology uh, and found uh, that they reported more than 1,000 school districts expressing interest in the software. So there's uh, clearly a, a movement to uh, implement and adopt this. We're also seeing uh, artificial intelligence play a role in university admissions. Uh, universities are increasingly using applicants' personal data gleaned from web tracking and social media account profiling 
uh, rather than from the admissions applications uh, themselves. Uh, so this is an October 2019 report uh, from the Washington Post uh, talking about how uh, various universities are using AI uh, to make uh, admissions decisions, and they're doing it based on social media profiles and other data that they can scrub. Um, a survey back in 2017 from the American Association of Collegiate Registrars uh, found that even two years ago, when this stuff was less well-known and less sophisticated, uh, already uh, a combination of 18%, almost one in five university registrants or registrars said uh, that they deny admission or rescind offers based on social media profiling of students. So it's a, it's a very live, very practical uh, issue. Uh, the Amazon experience, again, in using AI in uh, processing job applications. Uh, I think uh, the university employs many thousands of people. Would sure be nice if they could squeeze some efficiency out of the human resources department and have an AI filter the tens of thousands of applications they probably get every year. Um, concerns for bias there, obviously. Concerns for uh, discrimination. Concerns for uh, transparency and disclosure and how you would challenge the determinations of uh, a tool like this. For their part, Amazon found that their AI tool discriminated against women, and rather than trying to fix it, they just scrapped the thing entirely. Uh, so if they can't get it right, get it right uh, we worry about uh, smaller vendors producing these kinds of technologies. Uh, we're also reading uh, that uh, mental health profiling uh, is becoming a feature of campuses powered by AI. Uh, students are being encouraged, or in some cases required, mandated, uh, to download mental health support apps. Uh, but these may be profiling behaviors and being used uh, in unknown ways. Uh, some of those, uh, uh, this report has found, uh, can be used for uh, advertising. Um, that finding out that a student is using the mental health support app uh, might feed them uh, advertisements uh, for you know, medications uh, down in the US, uh, services that might be available. Uh, so it becomes this a bit of a perverse incentive, could potentially become a monetization stream uh, for some universities who want to take a cut of that advertising revenue. Uh, those kinds of issues are popping up. Uh, in one case, uh, a student suffering from an eating disorder uh, was presented an ad for laxatives. Or a student flagged as a suicide risk uh, is likely uh, to suffer from severe depression and may be denied a job or a security clearance, right? Uh, those are the kinds of issues that uh, are arising. Uh, campuses are also using AI uh, to uh, enforce safety, harassment, bullying, and reputation policies online. Uh, they are tracking social media profiles using artificial intelligence to uh, infer what those uh, social media postings might mean and to interpret whether or not those media postings might be a threat uh, to the campus, uh, that someone intends to uh, do something violent on campus. And of course, this can re result in uh, preemptive bans uh, on students from campus. Uh, and this has gone so far now that in the United States, uh, a bill has been introduced federally uh, that would actually mandate the use of uh, AI profiling of students in this way um, uh, as a sort of campus security measure, right? Obviously raises significant questions for freedom of expression, uh, open discourse on campus, uh, and so forth. Another example we're seeing of AI on campus is in social scoring. Uh, one firm using university Wi-Fi networks was monitoring students and told the Washington Post it gathered 6,000 location data points per student per day. So they can measure down to the second whether you're in the library uh, or at the campus pub or uh, going to the, um, uh, the sporting event uh, on campus and uh, they can use that as a nudge, you know? Knowing that you're not there, hey, how come you're not at the uh, stadium spending some money uh, watching the football game? Um, they can also track your attendance, right, and participation in class, and again, use that for uh, evaluation. Um, having a good score can also mean you, the, the uh, admissions or the hiring AI might put you at the top of the list. You wouldn't even know, right? Um, so those kinds of things can be happening. And as uh, Regina touched on uh, a little bit, uh, we're also finding that AI is driving more and more of people's interactions with the university online. So there's not even that sort of face-to-face -face human touch. Uh, if you need help, go through the AI. Uh, and to that uh, point, I just noticed the uh, announcement last week 
uh, that York has launched their own uh, student virtual uh, assistant uh, and are making more services available through this sort of AI uh, mediator. So panelists, uh, lots of examples of how uh, AI is uh, landing at the university raises uh, lots of questions. Uh, again, the link, uh, www.yorku.ca slash rights if you want to submit uh, a question. Let's get into it here. Um, Ruth, uh, inclusion promotes uh, diversity in admissions and hiring of faculty and staff. Uh, how does AI help or hinder these goals? Uh, can it uh, can it get us to that uh, utopia, or is it leading us to the dystopia? I guess is the question. Right. So, um, so I mean, I think right now at the university, we're probably. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming we're not using AI for for faculty hiring. I'm, I'm right now in a hiring co committee. We we looked at all the files by hand. Right. So we're not using AI right now for faculty hiring. But we can. I mean, we can look at you know, say hypothetical scenarios where say we wanted to use an automated system to, to um, say, maybe to decide on student admissions. And you know, I'm in a computer science school. And um, so we always we, um, have this, this everlasting problem that you know, uh, women participation in, 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 in computer science and engineering programs um, is nowhere where you know, we would maybe like it to be. Um, so now we could look at, I mean, or, or we often discuss how can, we, how can we increase this ratio. And if we wanted to, and, and of course, there can be hope that an automated system um, can 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 let us do it, do it in a systematic way, but but the issue is still that we we don't we we need a, to find a mathematical way um, of phrasing the the equity goal that so that that could then be implemented right and if, if we and we we very quickly run into situations where various um, reasonably sounding goals will technically run in, into contradictory scenarios right so for example we could say well we would like to you know um, except the same amount of, you know, um, say, um, say male and female, you know, students. Um, then of course we have an, we have quickly an issue that maybe we don't have enough participants. So let's maybe um, um, applicants, right? So maybe let's let's um, change change the change the um, um, the criterion and say, well, maybe what we would like to do is at least to be the system so that it doesn't make more mistakes on one type of um, one, one, one type of population than on the other. Maybe we'll, we look at historical data and we realize, oh, maybe on, on male, male um, um, among the male, male students that we, are, that, we, that we accepted, there's many more that fail in the end, right? So then it seems, oh, clearly, clearly the system is biased, right? So, but how would, how would, so now we can turn this into a criteria and we could you know, aim to optimize that, but how would a technical solution to that look like? Um, problem is that technical solutions to that may again lead to lead to new new situations that are that are not desirable. For example, what one could do, um, if I was, um, um, or what a system could do, it could say, well, okay, so let's, so if I wanted to change this ratio of failure given some population, um, I could start to hire the the weaker uh, or to 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 accept the weaker um, uh, applicants from the, from the from the protected. Population say right. So now I I I, um, I will probably equalize the failure rates right. So now maybe I, I arrived at a situation where where say male and female, um, whatever the categories may be, um, applicants fail at the same same um, rates. So now it seems more fair. Um, but what did I do? I I I um, I started. A, Accepting accepting populations, um, or I started essentially making the, the female group look worse right. because I I accepted the weak applicants from that group so to equalize this criterion. Right. So so I think the main I mean um, one of the main issues is that it's it's much easier to to recognize unfairness mm -hmm. than to to say what fairness should be and to say it in a way that is actually mathematically that we can mathematically phrase and then implement and then maybe even implement with an efficient algorithm. So there's many, many stages to this. So we don't yet have an algorithm of fairness. We don't have an algorithm of fairness, no. <laughs> um, uh, Incia, we've been talking a fair bit about uh, how uh, transparency can be a real problem for users of a system uh, or clients or customers of a system. I'm wondering how transparency might also bedevil like the institution itself. Um, so York University, for example, is uh, responsible for hiring of people. It's also responsible for things like uh, student housing and accommodation. 
And for that, you put ads out, right? Well, I'm reading headlines that are like, you know, Facebook is selecting who sees ads. Um, so, you know, how's the universe, like, how do they make themselves aware of uh, what's going on with AI? Like, do we need to uh, require the university to think about, you know, audits of the kinds of tools and platforms and technology they're using to, to make sure it's fair? Or is it just too easy to kind of look the other way? Mm -hmm. That's, I, I think that's a really good question. And um, actually, like, issues with discriminatory advertising on Facebook is something that we've been trying to deal with recently at the commission. And maybe I can sort of explain that a little bit and use it as an example mm -hmm. of kind of linking back to transparency and the types of questions that York may need to ask. So Ruth was talking about, you know, how you could have issues with AI use in making sort of admissions decisions or hiring and it can, I, I think like sort of advertising the opportunities at a university is sort of taking it even one step earlier and how AI can be problematic there. So, you know, we all know that there is advertising on Facebook and Facebook actually makes almost entirely all of its money from advertising and what it offers people, there are kind of two layers where there are issues. So what it offers people is the ability to what it offers advertisers is the ability to micro-target their ads. So if you want to post an ad on Facebook, one of the things you're presented with is sort of, you know, here are all of these different ways that you can select your audience or exclude people from your audience. And those um, categories are based off of sort of algorithmic analysis of user behavior. And there are hundreds and hundreds of categories. And some of them are things like gender and multicultural affinity, which is basically race, and then there are a whole bunch of them that are actually like much, much more specific. So if I was posting an ad, I could um, you know, have options like including or excluding people who are associated with breastfeeding or disability ramps or Black Lives Matter or you know, just like all, there, there's just so much content generated from analyzing user behavior. Um, and then, so, so that raises really, big questions about, again, discrimination in certain types of ads. So we know that if we wanted to, you know, if York wanted to post a job ad, for example, for a faculty position and advertise that, um, you know, if we saw it in the newspaper, we would never be okay if the ad said, you know, um, only white applicants should apply. Like, you know, we would obviously be like, that violates human rights laws, that's not okay. But what happens when behind the screens, or, you know, sort of behind the scene, you can choose your audience so that ad is actually only getting delivered to people that have certain identity characteristics or a certain population. So that's one layer, and I think it's important for a university like York when using pretty much any online advertising platform. So this is true of Facebook, but it's also true of Google and you know a bunch of other things. Targeting advertisements is an issue, and important questions should be asked about how do you target those ads to promote inclusion? But then there's the second layer that also engages, where I think AI is really engaged that can be problematic. So say I wanted to post an ad um, for you know, a particular job, or maybe it's you know, for um, promoting the engineering program. And I, and I you know, specifically know that it's an issue, you know, that you, you want to have sort of more representation from women in engineering. And so I really specifically choose, like, you know, I want this ad to go to these different populations. What happens is I get to choose the audience that I want it to go out to, but then Facebook actually decides using its algorithms who, like, actually sees it in their feed, because it's not going to be everybody. It's going to be some subgroup. And those algorithms are optimizing based on analysis to do with uh, analysis about who is what, who's likely to actually interact with that ad or who who what are the profiles of people that end up in engineering programs and so even if i actually make those selections and i want it to you know i i try to choose something very inclusive in terms of how i put an ad out when facebook gets it and sends it out based on their ai analysis it might actually still predominantly show up for white men or, you know, so, and, and they've actually done research on this showing that even when you choose inclusive categories, in the end, the ad still gets delivered in a really, really skewed way. So in terms of, you know, this being a question for York and also thinking about transparency, I think one layer is, you know, the sort of more obvious one of York being really thoughtful about when it's advertising something like certain programs or faculty positions or funding opportunities, you know, 
what kind of decisions is it making about what audience will see those? But then when you use a service to deliver your ad or the information that you're trying to send out into the world, it, it's probably important now for organizations like York to ask the service how it's going to work. So Facebook, what are you going to do with this? Can I get data on who is actually seeing this ad? Can I get like, you know, I, I do want this to be distributed in this particular demographic way. And I think it's that you kind of have to take that to the second level and probe, you know, it, it might be important for organizations like York to then ask those really critical questions and not just trust that you know, the algorithm or the AI being used by the service you're engaging isn't going to discriminate. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I was just handed like eight questions, so uh, I'll take a look at those in just a sec. First, I'll bounce it uh, back to you, uh, Regina. Um, I think the kind of double-edged sword we're, we're looking at uh, that the university faces in, in the advertising uh, world uh, also applies to uh, social media. On one hand, we're saying, there's a lot of dangers in having the institution profiling people on social media and coming to conclusions about them. On the other hand, uh, they are obligated as an employer, as a service provider, uh, to create a safe space, to make sure people aren't experiencing harassment on campus, that people aren't being bullied, uh, that known threats can be uh, allayed. Um, so, you know, uh, Sort of what's at stake for the, how does the university sort of uh, find that fine line between, uh, you know, wielding the ban hammer, uh, but also, you know, uh, using AI for good to, uh, to, to follow through on their obligations as an employer and a service provider? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question given how much time people spend now on social media. Yeah. And the university obviously doesn't have direct control over what happens. I mean, so the university can't do anything about what students choose to post. And there's very complicated questions about how to manage disciplinary measures, even if that's even possibly appropriate. Uh, but I think what's important here is to think about the educational purpose of the institution as a university. What can we teach students to do? And so I think really important things to help students be aware of the way algorithms are distorting the experience they have on the internet. Let me give you a really quick example of this. This happened in the US in late 2016. It was in Texas. There was a rally organized outside of an Islamic cultural center in Texas. And the rally was the Stop the Islamification of Texas rally, Stop Sharia Law. And there was a counter protest organized against it at the same time at the same place, Stop Islamophobia in Texas. And what nobody realized was that both protests were organized by the same people. They were organized by fake accounts run out of St. Petersburg, Russia. This was huh. part of the giant Russian social media interference operation, US politics. Wow. The whole point here was to cause social division. Now, that was not AI. That was actual real people doing that behind fake profiles. But the way AI matters here is that the social media algorithm is driven by engagement. And engagement just means, do you stop and click on this? Do you stop scrolling long enough to look at it? And then the stuff that makes you angry, stuff that gets us uh, involved in social antagonism is exactly what engagement is sensitive to. And so that's exactly why the people designing this fake interference operation picked socially divisive topics. So the algorithms amplify that and give you the impression when you're scrolling through social media, because that's what pops up into the top of your feed. You don't see everything, obviously, on social media. You see the things that drive engagement, because that's what keeps you scrolling, and that's what generates ad revenue for the social media platforms. So you will see the stuff that's most divisive, and you'll get a false picture of the degree of antipathy and anger out there, and also just racism and sexism and so forth. Certainly these things exist, but they, they tend to get promoted. And so it's important, I think, for us to teach students to recognize the way in which when they're using social media platforms, what they're being exposed to is not raw social reality. It is a thing that's been amplified and distorted in ways that benefits the company that runs the platform. And that can mean presenting them with an unrepresentative sample of how people are actually interacting with each other. So I think that's the first step. The second step, and the harder one, that's something I can address in a couple minutes right now, but is thinking about how to square that misrepresentation they fed on social media with the real actual problems of uh, various forms of oppression and discrimination, which are very much real, but how to get that conversation going while also recognizing that what they're being shown in the digital world is not fully accurate and is really intended to, to promote uh, divisiveness rather than finding some sort of inclusion or, or, or justice. Phenomenal. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, Trevor, uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, uh, how we can use AI for good uh, on campus, how AI might actually be used to promote uh, safe spaces in the classroom uh, and otherwise. Uh, you know, give, give me your hot takes on some of these. One person asks, 
Um, you know, from an AI perspective, if a student consistently receives A's and all of a sudden is getting D's, you know, should be legitimately be worried about that student. And would that be a legitimate example of kind of uh, reaching out and doing a wellness check uh, with that student? Um, you know, obviously there's good aspects to that. Maybe there's some problematic aspects. So what's your take on, uh, on those kinds of uh, opportunities and, and how AI might, uh, might help or hinder in the classroom? Sure. Um, <clears throat> And I'm, Ryan, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll, I'll yeah. maybe give a couple of bullet points and sure. then we can see where we get, because I know we've got more ground to cover. Yeah. Um, I'll take that last question seriously and I'll think about it. Marion started us off with this. What I'll think about is what's the goal of today? What's the goal of what we're trying to accomplish here in this idea of um, EDI, uh, ideas of empowerment, inclusion, re representation, uh, engagement? So the sort of the positive notions of what we're trying to accomplish and then in the context of this panel, AI, right? Um, and maybe I'll mention a couple things from two perspectives, one from an administrative perspective at the university and one from an educating perspective. And I can't speak for the university as a whole, um, but I've been, former, I've been the associate dean at Osgoode for a couple of, couple of rounds. So thinking about it from an administrative perspective, I would say that we are not particularly far down the road at York and certainly not at Osgoode uh, in terms of really engaging the, the sort of horizons of AI. You know, the provost announced a couple of days ago, and Ryan, you mentioned this, a did, a, you know, an online assistant. And I think that's an example, um, you know, with a really good faith effort to try and empower students to figure out, where do I go, what do I do, particularly when I need help, if I, if I don't want to ask someone because I'm nervous, or I don't want to out myself for a particular reason, or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of fabulous reasons why a digital assistant can help, particularly when you're at a moment when there isn't a person around and you really need someone. So I think that goes to the idea of that question that you just received, Ryan, about you know using it for good. I think that's a really good faith effort to try and make a place inclusive, uh, accessible, etc. Um, and uh, you know, I wouldn't say that we're using that a ton, for example, in dispute resolution or in terms of how we manage students or complaints or what have you. We're still a very human paper, you know, sort of process focused place, as are many. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we need to decide where we're at. And some of those um, rule of law values, I'll call them, or process or transparency values will come all of there. So I think there's stuff from an administrator perspective, from uh, thinking about my day job in the classroom as, as an educator, um, you know, first of all, I got to say, I don't want that program running in my classroom because, you know, what is when everyone's asleep? What does that might say? Be looking at you too. Are they yeah. are they in bliss? It's so perfect that they're all just in nirvana. Or yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, you know, I think the idea um, around um, what do we do with AI from uh, bringing people into the educational experience, and I think it both it goes both ways. So I'll think of two very low level but practical examples. One would be um, sort of technology in the classroom where we don't have to ask people to put up their hand. So we want to get a sense of where people are at, but it's not meant to be a popularity contest. Some people don't like to speak out loud. Some people don't even want to put up their hand to say, yes, I think X or Y. So we now use AI, everyone can click a button, and we get a survey, or you can use your phone, or you can use the app, or whatever, and we can get a sense of where people are, and it's a really interesting way to discuss stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so that might be one way of thinking it's a positive, inclusive, brings everyone in the game. Um, a different perspective would be yesterday in this room, we had Aboriginal Legal Services come in to, into my legal process class to talk about uh, um, dispute resolution in child welfare cases. And so we had the room set up. There wasn't this stage. The it was a circle. Um, all the students were sitting around the outside. Um, it was old school. People were in the room. People were talking, people were engaging, uh, there, were, there was um, elders and knowledge keepers running the process and talking and what have you. And overwhelmingly, the, the reaction as students were talking, because everyone was asked to speak, was um, this is, I didn't actually know where that person was from. Uh, the most valuable thing was actually seeing someone face to face as opposed to the back of their head. Um, I actually had to come to class today and hear someone speak. Right. And so, there's that positive human side that we alienate when we're using technology. And so I think we've never been more connected and we've never been more alone in the world. Yeah. And I think finding ways to empower but not to lose that notion in the classroom that there is something that we seem to value about a, a university where people come together. Mm -hmm. 
and engage and sometimes clash, not physically, I mean, but just with ideas and thinking through how do we move forward as a society. So that's where I'm really interested from an education perspective is not totally going down the road where we literally take ourselves off the map in a, in a real space uh, to engage. Uh, I think that's uh, 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 optimistic. And you know, I got a question that kind of builds on this theme of optimism. And, and Ruth, maybe I'll bounce this over at you for your, uh, your quick take. Um, you know, are we asking kind of the wrong questions of AI? Uh, we're deploying AI in hiring to filter applications out. Can we use AI to filter applications in? Uh, if, we write, if we ask the right questions of AI, could it be used, for example, to promote diversity in hiring uh, as, as opposed to sort of reproducing uh, norms of exclusion? Is, that, is it just that we're asking the wrong questions of it? Yeah. Um, somehow the use of technology makes these problems more more apparent, right? So maybe that's a good thing. I think there is there is also um, um, optimistic um, op an optimistic take on this 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 viewpoint that you know machine learned methods they they come with the biases of their data. Um, but of course, I mean, we, we, we do have some control, for example, as you said, over the data that we feed them, right? So for example, as humans, we, you know, we build, we build ideas and we come with, you know, so and so many years or decades of experience and, 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 and it's, very, it's very difficult for us um, often to, 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 you know, to be, say, to be neutral, neutral in, with respect to problems that we would like to be neutral mm -hmm. um, about, right? Whereas, whereas an algorithm, we can, we can, we get to decide um, say what is the time period of data that it that, that it's being trained on, right? So if we don't want the algorithm to be influenced by by some you know ideas from from you know five decades ago, then we can choose to to train it on data that was maybe collected in the last two years, right? right. Um, so so we do have um, so there is an, there is an opportunity as well to um, um, for these systems, um, and I, I mean I think another another aspect. Um, that we um, that we could be optimistic about is that you know to some degree degrees alg algorithms are maybe more testable than humans, right? Mm -hmm. An algorithm, an algorithm may maybe not behave differently when it's um, or um, you know make different decision when it's being observed rather than when when it's not being observed, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what humans maybe do all, all the time, right? Um, so there's also there's there's I think there are some optimistic aspects to yeah. the use of algorithms for decisions. Of Hum decision support. Humans, well. of course, can feel shame. So right, exactly. Now we're <laughs> Maybe not that's feel ashamed. We need to build into the AI <laughs> feeling of shame. Uh, okay, this has been uh, terrific. Uh, I just want to uh, pivot with the last ten minutes we have left now to sort of our, our third segment, uh, which is turning our mind to what some of the fixes are. Um, put yourself standing at the uh, water cooler with the uh, York University president or provost. You know, you kick off a discussion of AI and you say. Here's what I think you know ought to be sort of a, a number one or number two priority uh, for the university in contending a with AI. Maybe I can just go down the panel and kind of get your hot take. Where should we be turning our mind for uh, priority, prioritizing our response to AI? If I was at that water cooler discussion, I think there are two things that would pop into my head. So one is, uh, you know, when we're talking about AI tools, sometimes there's this there's a stage where you're, you know, you de you develop the tool and then you're testing it, and then you you might say, okay, is this ready to sort of be used or deployed? And you could be like, okay, well, this looks, you know, 98% accurate. That's really great. I think it's ready to go out. And uh, something that we're seeing is that that accuracy can be different for different groups of people. So a, an example that comes up a lot is that facial recognition can be really, really accurate with. Um, white men's faces, but less so with a lot of other groups. And so one thing that I think can could be helpful is that if York is going to decide to use some sort of tool um, to decide readiness in a disaggregated way, so not necessarily sort of overall accurateness, but or overall accuracy, but also to sort of disaggregate based on those types of groups that are protected, based on things like race and gender, and then see is that accuracy rate different for different groups and to kind of proactively do that. And then the second thing really quickly, and, and even actually hearing about the virtual assistant made me wonder about this, is um, 
sometimes using tools and, and using vendors for certain AI tools raises a question about what's happening with the data and the students' data. So, you know, for example, if AI, or, or if York has developed that virtual assistant itself, then, you know, that assistant is probably going to be collecting a lot of data about what types of questions are being asked and, you know, like what answers are helpful provided when, you know, all the sort of facial recognition stuff that could happen on campus, is it York that owns that data, but if York contracts out with someone to provide that service, another company, does is it that company that's going to own students' data? And so I think maybe also just starting to think about when you're using these things, you know, data is a big part of it and has these really big implications in what is the university doing or thinking about how to protect that. Um, maybe I'll think about it from the education side. I, one of the things I do here is teach legal process. So thinking about it from a procedural pr perspective, mm -hmm. uh, the water, to, water cooler conversation, sort of um, where are we going. If we look at the dispute resolution literature and at the access to justice literature, Ryan, you alluded to this earlier, uh, people are typically much more engaged, much more persuaded by, and much more included by a system that they participate in and that reflects them and that sort of sees, they can see themselves in the system. So that's point number one. And point number two is people are more likely to agree with an outcome or uh, be satisfied with an outcome and have some success with an outcome if they've, if they've participated in the system. So using those two things, I guess the thing I would say is that it's critical for us as society, but in particular at York as we're moving forward, really to engage um, those who are using it, those who are going to be using it, really engaging students, the folks who are in it, um, and it seems trite, but we don't do a good job of that typically, which is not to say we should abandon expertise. I think experts are critical for this across the spectrum, but I think we should not forget the user. Um, and so in a, in a grand survey that I've done recently after knowing I was going to be on this panel, I started asking my kids and their friends about what do they care about. And one theory is, well, that's totally irrelevant. And another theory is, that's the whole question. Um, and somewhere in there, I think it ma matters um, in terms of people who are at university who are going to be at university shortly um, and really engaging them in the process as well as the rest of the experts around. Yeah, I, I agree with that and maybe add that, um, yeah, we, I, I think what we really should be doing is create more conversations, create more connections between experts at different disciplines. Um, because I think many of the problems or of the fears um, stem from us being, I mean, we, we connect a lot with our, with our, um, with our research community, with, with, with people that have very similar education, very, very similar ways of thinking, and we don't connect as easily or as naturally, even on campus, um, with, with experts from, from, other, from other disciplines. And I think there's a lot to be gained from developing a language together that will, that will help us understand the, 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 the problems in different, in di from different perspectives to develop solutions. Regina. I, yeah, I think the main way York should approach this is thinking about it through educational purposes. And let me give you a quick example of something we've done, and then something I think we need to do. So something that's already happened, uh, Schulich and Lassonde launched a joint program in master's degrees in, in AI uh, over the last year. And um, a required course for all students in those programs is a course in AI ethics. Uh, and this is a joint collaboration between Schulich and Lassonde in my department in philosophy. So I got involved in this and I designed the AI ethics curriculum for the program. We hired a postdoc, uh, Prisa Musavi, who's an amazing researcher in both moral philosophy and also she knows machine learning. And so she teaches that class and does an amazing job of it. So every single student who's going through that program right now is being exposed to discussions about, about algorithmic bias, about all the differential effects on justice that AI can have, and the next generation of people who are designing these systems as engineers and as product leads at tech companies, you know, green light in these projects will actually have exposure to this stuff, which wasn't always true in the past about people in those educational pathways. Mm -hmm. So that's something we've already done. The second thing is something I think we can do across the curriculum, not just in computer science departments, not just in business schools, but that is try to develop concepts that help people in all sorts of areas understand this stuff. There's this idea from the philosopher Miranda Fricker, it's called hermeneutic justice, mm -hmm. and the idea is uh, do we provide justice to people by having available to them terms and concepts that describe their experience? So a very quick example, back in the 1970s, before the 70s, women working in business would experience a form of excuse me, mistreatment in the workplace they didn't have a term for. It's, we now call it sexual harassment. But the inavailability of that term was a form of injustice by itself because women couldn't get people to respond to what they were facing. 
because there was no term available. I think we're right now there with a huge number of things that happen in AI because we don't have the terminology to express right now how to understand inclusion, justice, representation, and all those things on, in, in machines which are represented in ones and zeros rather than human concepts. So that's a place where I think all kinds of disciplines across the university can get to work on thinking about using our tools, our disciplinary tools, how can we re-describe these things that are happening in digital space that are sensible to people. Uh, we're getting uh, inundated with uh, loads of questions, so I've been uh, given the grace to extend our time by about uh, five minutes to try and address some of those. Um, one cluster of questions, uh, and I'll put this question out to all of you, is around uh, uh, access to justice. People are asking, like, you know, does AI fall under the human rights code? Does AI and data fall under privacy legislation? Um, if I don't like a decision that some AI on university has made about me, what can I do about it? Um, so for me, this is a question about access to justice in AI uh, and how we hold the university account. Um, how might we hold the university account if it starts uh, deploying AI systems that are making decisions? Do we have the procedures in place right now uh, to contend with a student complaint about an AI decision? I'll, briefly, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, but not perfectly. Um, so, I, and they would be, um, and there, there may be others in the room uh, for sure. Should jump up if I've got this wrong, and I know there will be others out there who have a better sense of me. Um, but we would still be using traditional um, processes to review those decisions. So, for example, if there were a decision made at a university by an instructor on a grade based on an algorithm or what have you, we would have um, uh, our are collegial committees that would look at those, and it would go through the, the Senate collegial committee structure uh, all the way up to Senate. Um, so it would depend on an academic standing issue, a discipline issue, um, what have you. Uh, and if it were uh, a decision made by the university in terms of whether or not to offer a course on a particular, because of a particular decision or, or group of students, or whether or not to host a conference based on a certain outcome that they might expect or not expect, um, we are seeing decisions from courts whether or not to review university decisions, and, there's, and there's, there's law on that. And some people think that the university essentially is a, it's the last say on, on, uh, on based on academic freedom and institutional freedom. Other courts are saying it's not so clear, and for sure the human rights code would come in. For sure other issues would come in. The university's now started to see subject to charter um, issues uh, in different ways. And so, it's complicated, but we still have notions of procedural fairness in this country, so we haven't abandoned that. Right. I think we are still within that notion of uh, the machine becoming part of our uh, legal world, and the question is, is that legal world able to manage that interface in a meaningful, uh, responsive way? That, of course, assumes that you know that the AI has played a role in the decision being made. Uh, so we also got uh, two or three uh, questions around uh, the idea of mandatory disclosure. And uh, you know, the questions are essentially asking, one, you know, is there any legislation or legal policy to suggest that organizations should identify uh, when an AI is in place? Uh, and two, you know, uh, for this university, I guess the answer to that is if not, uh, you know, should this university have a pol consider a policy on mandatory disclosure of an AI, for example, in the, uh, the New York student uh, virtual assistant, if there's an AI at play there? Hot takes? Transparency relating to AI is something that we've been thinking about a lot, a, a great deal, and I, it, it does seem really important, I think, especially in these early stages, for people to understand, you know, where and how AI is being used in decision making. And I, I, and I think it is something that, you know, as, as far as I am aware, this is not required or regulated in any way, but it, it does seem important, and I think the tendency that or the pattern that we're seeing is that AI is being introduced without that being disclosed in a lot of in in a lot of arenas, and and that's tricky. And then something that I was thinking about, which may or may not relate exactly to these questions, or it might be a blend of the first two questions, is um, you know, sort of transparency and access to justice. Is that um, you know? So for example, again, like the Human Rights Code would. It's not whether it applies to AI or not, it's does it apply to situations where AI is being used. So if AI is being used in employment or in service delivery or in housing, then 
yes, it would apply. And the way that it would work, so say you were in a situation and you, you let's say you know that AI is used, or maybe you don't know, and um, there's a concern that it's discriminatory or there is a bias and that's something that you, you want to challenge. You could sort of raise those human rights concerns. You could file a human rights claim or you could raise them with the university. And the way that that would sort of play out is that at some point, York would have to answer to that. And so York would need to say, you know, when you say this is, if you look at this discriminatory pattern, um, York would have the opportunity to explain why it's discriminatory or why it's not discriminatory. Um, or, you know, can they provide a non-discriminatory reason for why that pattern might exist? And that rate does sort of mean that they, if, if York is using AI, they would need to say, okay, well, we have this tool and we're using it and this was the outcome of the tool. But if that is still biased and it's a black box, like AI can't say, we, you know, if, if, if York is sort of like, but we don't know why the tool yeah. came out with these outputs, that could be a pretty big problem. Yeah. So sometimes as you go down that pathway, it, as human rights concerns come up, I think what we may find is that there is AI in the background. And it's important for York to think about, you know, sort of what are its duties to, you know, to be able to respond to concerns of discrimination, either because something is officially come up or actually just if the concerns arise, York actually has a duty to look into issues of systemic discrimination. Very quickly, um, I, uh, building on Ijia's point about it, it, a different way to think about it would be if we think about our university community as objects or subjects. If there mm -hmm. were objects, our students and our community members are things that we do things to, then we can think it from a sort of an obligation perspective. What does the law require? What do we need to disclose? How much do we need to tell? All that sort of kind of reactive, almost scared approach. The other is ideas of bringing people in as subjects or participants or part of the community, right. and then thinking through, well, sure, we may have some institutional obligations, but th that's kind of the, the floor, the, the low bar. What can we do? And typically, people want to know what's happening. If you give people information, it empowers them. It brings them into the, into the conversation. And so um, to me, it's about legal rights of disclosure is one thing. Another is sort of um, just notions of what's the right thing to do from engagement. And I think we will have a much more responsive, inclusive, and also um, not just happy, but people will buy into a community if they know what's happening. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about what grade I got, but how am I being treated by this place? It seems to me to be a really exciting uh, way to think about it. It's interesting to think about uh, how the university can foster that uh, through its unique role. Uh, you know, building on uh, Ruth's points about interdisciplinarity, for example. We need that interdisciplinary input into the development of these things to, to try and get it right. And that's research, right? Like, Absolutely. this is what we do here, so yeah. let's, let's teach and think about it. Yeah, and so it's something uniquely that the university can, can be uh, proactive about and, uh, and show its support. And actually, here's a, a final question uh, that I'll uh, ask you, Ruth, and, and anyone else, you know. Uh, how can the university better ensure that uh, tech students uh, are learning about how to uh, unpack these problems from an equity perspective? Um, and, you know, I think I would expand that beyond the tech student. Uh, it's not all on them. Uh, these are challenging questions for all of us. So, um, you know, should the university be thinking about policies and ways to better support this? And, and I guess integrate it into the curriculum, or, or is it already? It is integrated to, to the curriculum to, to some degree. I mean, mm. there, are, there are courses um, relating to, you know, social implications of, for example, computing. Yeah. There's a course that you mentioned in the Masters of AI um, program. Um, I think there's... Uh, also, you know, in the process of de developing um, new additional courses, um, um, maybe relate taking these type of questions and and, and 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 looking at what kind of what kind of technical solutions are there are there currently which technical solution um, is maybe addressing which which problem. Um, so there are courses and yeah. Okay, cool, excellent. All right, uh, we are at uh, 11.50 sharp, which is pretty darn impressive. Uh, I want to thank our uh, wonderful panel for a tremendous discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground, and I think we've pointed to a lot of potential solutions that the university can fix. So thank you very much, everybody.